All righty, folks. Welcome back to the Mushing Alaska's podcast. Excuse me, Mushing Alaska podcast coverage of the 2024 Iditarod. It is day four, and we are super excited for our next guest. Before I get into our next guest, just want to give a quick Sean update. So, Sean is, first started in Finger Lake and was in Nikolai, and then I believe overnight he moved over to Takatna. And so, uh, obviously, we've been excited to see Sean out there giving us some live feedback of what he's seen at the different checkpoints. And, uh, you know, again, a shout out to the Insider crew. To me this year, the coverage that they're providing seems a lot stronger than it has in the last few years from my perspective um having sean out there having katie joe i noticed one of the videos had like a really nice drone footage and you know so um as i've said every day and i'll say again today we are supplemental to them and uh we encourage you guys to you know subscribe to them accordingly because that's where i'm getting a lot of my information but with that I don't want to keep our guests waiting too much longer, so I'm going to bring on our next guest, and that is Mr. Rob Cook. Welcome on today. How you doing, sir? I'm good, thanks, Brendan. Thanks ever so much for inviting me on. Thank you, thank you for, thank you for your time. And uh, I know that we're up against the clock today, so I want to kind of get right into things. And you know, the first thing I think we need to start with is this daggum story on the moose um before we went live i was <laughs> i was kind of joking like i thought when i was talking about this a day or two ago that would kind of be the end of it but here we are and that's not the end of it so i'm curious to get your take on the situation yeah i mean uh yeah we i mean we did chat about it a bit before we came on air i mean I, I don't, you know, I don't, I joked with you, I don't have insider, so I'm probably the least informed uh, person you're going to have, you're going to have on the podcast. But, I, you know, I was catching up uh, yesterday afternoon on race positions and I started seeing some of the posts about what was going on. Um, and I, I'm, I'm with you. I was, as far as I was concerned, you know, I heard, I heard what happened on um, when it was Sunday night, Monday morning, and it seemed that Dallas did everything correctly. You know, he, um, he had a he had a moose encounter. He he had to put the moose. Unfortunately, he had to put the moose down. Um, he gutted it and he went to the next checkpoint and reported it. And you know, if you look at the rules, he did everything exactly by the rules. The rules do you know the rules don't state you have to field even field dress the moose. They just say gut it. Um, and I've no doubt that ninety five to one hundred percent of the mushers would have done exactly the same thing. Now, I mean, they, you know, it sounded like the, 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 you know, the meat had been recovered and there didn't seem to be a problem. Um, but obviously we don't, you know, and, and, I, and I gather that uh, Dallas had also said that, you know, he hadn't done a, a pretty job. You know, it wasn't a, it wasn't a fantastic job, but he'd complied with, the, he, you know, he'd complied with the rules. Um, he gutted it and he reported it at the next checkpoint. Um, I think I find it incredible that there are people calling for him to be disqualified from the race I, I it's it's unbelievable I'm, I'm i'm super super surprised that they've penalized him um you know the i i went back and looked again yesterday and the rules say you got the moose and you reported the next checkpoint and that's exactly what exactly what he did um and you know maybe to generate a bit more controversy to get a you know to get a time penalty um you have the, the, again the rules state that to get a time penalty you have to have broken the rules and you have to have gained a competitive advantage. And I see, I you know, maybe you can say different. I cannot see how killing a moose and gutting it gave him a competitive advantage. I, you know, at, at the at the best, he should get a time. He should get, um, you know, he should get a financial penalty because that's no, you know, because I don't, I can't see that he's gained a competitive advantage. And I, I know we're going to come on to talk about this. I think the race at the moment is really close, um, you know, between him and Travis and maybe and maybe Ryan. And and if if he loses the race by less than two hours, <laughs> and if I was Dallas, I would be. I you know he's he's obviously going to appeal this at the end of the race. You know he's he's bound to do that unless you know unless he wins clearly. Um, 
But if he if he loses this by less than two hours, I wouldn't just be going to ITC to the appeal board for ITC. I'd be getting in a lawyer and I'd be taking this to court because he has not broken the rules. If any, you know, he has complied with the rules. So I, I you know, I, you know, I, I know that this is, um, it's decided by a race panel of, you know, a three, uh, three way race panel. So they've obviously sat and talked about it. Um, but I think they need to be, they, you know, they, they need to be really careful. I and, mean, you know, but again, you know, we're speculating. We don't, the only, the only people who know what's happened is Dallas um, and whoever recovered the meat. And then, you know, whoever then reported that to, uh, to the race officials. I just, I, I just want to, sorry, I'm sorry to ramble on. I, I just want to touch on a few other things that a lot of the people commenting are sat in their front rooms in the lower 48 with a cup of coffee in, in front of them. Cheers. You know, when you run, I've never had a moose. Stomp, yeah. That's me. <laughs> I've never had a moose. I've never had a moose stomp my team. That's, ne you know, that's never happened to me, but I can, you know, I've had dozens and dozens of encounters where I've run into moose and it is frightening. And when that happens at night and you can hardly see what's going on, that re that makes it 10 times worse. And then, you know, to have the moose come into your team, and you've got to you've got to make a decision that you're going to kill that moose and not only have you got to kill the moose you've got to shoot it in such a way that it's not going to fall into your dogs and it's you know it's it's early monday morning it's pitch black his adrenaline must have been going absolutely ballistic uh and he's got um he's got you know a 16 dog team you know okay we'll come back to the dog you know potentially being injured but those dogs uh, they, you know, they are, I know what my, my dogs are like when they come across a moose, they are going to be absolutely pumped up. And he's got a championship winning 16 dog team, less than a hundred miles into the race. They are going to be going absolutely ballistic. It's going to be super hard, no matter how, and it, it, Dallas, I've seen Dallas at races. He's got a lot of control over his dogs. His dogs are really well trained, but still to try and, to try and gut a moose while he's trying to make sure that that dog team doesn't take off and he's got a he's got a sick dog to look after you know people are saying oh you only spent 10 minutes there jesus you know he spent 10 minutes there trying to control the dog team and gut a moose at the same time that 10 minutes would have seemed like hours and hours to him while he's trying you know he's concerned about um about his dogs and, I, and you know people have said oh well, he should have turned around and gone back to squentner Again, this is a 16 dog dog team, super hyped up at the start of a race. I remember I remember trying to camp between Yentna and Squentner one year with a 16 dog team and I couldn't stop them. They, every time I tried to pull over, they were just dragging me back down the trail. I ended up having to run for six, to, to the 65 mile mark. Um, and he's also, sorry, you've really got me on a rant now about this. No, this is great. He's not, he's not. He, he is one of the most intelligent mushers that, that I've met. I don't know him super well, but obviously I've met him at races. I've been to his kennel. He is one of the most intelligent mushers I, I, I know. He knows his dogs. He knows better than anybody on this race. He knows what bad PR is. He, you know, he is, you know, regardless of, you know, what happened over the uh, alleged um, drugging incident back in, you know, a few years ago, he knows what bad PR is. He is the person who's there with his dogs. He would have looked at that dog. There's no way, absolutely no way that he would have thought that dog was in a critical condition or that dog's life was at threat. If, if he thought that, he would have got done anything he could to get that dog back to Squentner. Um, he was there. He assessed the dog. Um, and he, he obviously made the decision that it wasn't critical. And I've not seen anything that where he actually said the dog was critical. I've seen posts from his PR person who's back at the count, you know, back at the kennel, who said that the dog was critical and their, their job, we, you know, we all know what social media is like, they want to create drama. And by saying it's critical that they're creating drama that, you know, I think the dog is for Lou, I think it's back at home now. Yep. And, yep. you know, Mitch posted something this morning that the dog had, the dog had lacerations and, and these people are saying he, you know, that his dog care isn't good and, and he should be disqualified. There's, he knows that I mean, there are very, very specific rules for what happens if a dog dies. If that, uh, and you know, I, I, had to, I had to check this up last night when you know when I was reading some of the posts. the The only incident 
when you're not withdrawn from a race if a dog dies, as if, it, as if it's something, and it's specific, you know, it says that, it, you know, maybe a moose encounter. But it, Dallas isn't, you know, Dallas isn't going to know that. He's not going to be assessing that. He's going to know that if a dog dies under his care, the whole world is going to come down on his head. And he's going to he's going to be, even if he's not withdrawn from the race, at the next checkpoint, he's going to be held there for hours and hours and hours while he's going through the paperwork, while he's explaining what happens. So there's, there's absolutely... Um, there's no, there's no way he thought that dog's life was in danger. And, and and one other thing, whatever you think about Dallas, you know he he is a champion. Yet yeah, he's he's uh, he's very he's very professional. He is not going to want one of his dogs to die. No, there's absolutely no way. The emotional damage that that would cause to him on the race is in, is incredible. I, I yeah, I'm I'm sorry to rant, but people who think that he deliberately endangered the life of his dogs and he should be disqualified. They have no idea what they're talking about. They really, they really don't. And I, you know, I can, I, I should like me have a look at my Facebook account and see people unfollowing me. You know, <laughs> but the, the fact of the matter is, I am convinced, one thousand percent convinced that if he thought that dog was critical and that dog's life was in danger, he would have turned around and gone back to and gone back to Squenna. He, um, you know, and again, the post, the post that Mitch made this morning. Uh, said that there were, um, you know, maybe there were some lacerations, but the, it, you know, it could have been, a, um, I don't know, it could have, been, it could have been anything. But he, he obviously didn't think that dog was in a critical condition. Otherwise, he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have gone on to Finger Lake. I am convinced of that. Right. So, all right. My question to follow up to that is, what's your opinion on the timing? of this i mean we talked we were talking about this like three days ago why did it come out last night that there's uh, they're doing the penalty that the timing of this is where i that's a really good question yeah so what's your thoughts and i've um, i've actually um again i mean this is this is all spec you know this is all speculation um and I went and ha- I had a look at some of his, you know, his timings through Ofa and through Tocotna. I mean, they have they have to declare the penalty. I think in accordance with the rules, the penalty has to be declared within 48 hours of the incident happening. Um, and again, this was I saw a post from his um, his social media person. And again, it was uh, it was an over it was an over dramatic post. Um, but it said, oh, you know, this. how is this going to affect Dallas when he comes into critical, you know, when he comes into cripple? Um, I, I seriously hope the race officials told him about this before they put out the press release. You know, he was, um, I think it was probably, he, I think maybe it was McGrath, he maybe, he maybe spent a couple of hours. I hope they caught him. It, it, he was very, he was really quick through Ofa and to Kotner. So I can't imagine that they told him there, but I, I really hope that they told him before they put this press release out. I really, you know, I really do, um, because that is just not, if they've announced this without even talking to him about it, that is bad. But again, this is just speculation. Spec- I've got, a, yeah. you know, I, you know I, I've known Warren for a long time. I've got a huge amount of, um, a huge amount of respect for Warren. You know, he was the, uh, he was the race judge in Roan, um, I think that must have been in 2016. Super, and, and Sebastian has, you know, Sebastian has been around for um, a long time. You know, done a lot of racing. He's been a judge on the Quest, on the Iditarod. So he's, you know, that, you know, they know, you know, they know what they're what they're doing. Um, so uh, you know, on on the timing, I guess it, it is somewhere in the rules that the the penalties need to be need to be told. You know, need to be announced within 48 hours. But I I really really hope that they told. They'd spoke to to Dallas before they before they made this announcement. Um, yeah, it, but again, I mean, we are we are just speculating. I mean, if yep. you look at yep. again, we go back to go back to the point. If you look at the rules, he did. Dallas did everything in accordance with the rules. The rules say you gut the moose, and that's what he did. The you know the rules don't again. They don't say you field dress. They don't say you take out all the internal organs. Um, so yeah, but again, I. If, if if he loses this race by two hours, less than two hours, this is going to be, this is going to be coming up again at the end of the race, and and a long time after. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, I just, you know, it, we could sit here and speculate. We can sit here and after the fact, break things down. We don't know what it's like that, what they're going through, but, yeah. um, you know, I, it just surprises me that it took this long to figure out that he needed to be, uh, penalized for it. My yeah. other question is unrelated to the dog injury is you're talking to someone who's never hunted before you're talking to someone who's ne- like is is there a way to have killed the moose but have not done it in accordance with the state law like what is your opinion on that nope i mean no i i mean the- you know, the, the in terms of the killing the moose, he was definitely within the rules of the race and state rules. That like there was definitely a threat to his uh, his life and and property. You know, and I mean the fact that one of his you know the fact that one of his dogs got injured. That um, yeah is so he was definitely within uh, within state and race race rules. And as I said, he. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, obviously the moose was you know, the fact that that Wally and page run over the moose the moose was obviously in the trail it wasn't off the trail yep. um i don't you know, again i don't know you know maybe it had stomped his dogs the fact that it stomped his wheel dogs makes you think that it was either still in the it was either still in the, the team or it had gone behind the sled um if it had gone behind the sled i can't imagine i, I can't imagine he'd have shot it if it had gone behind the sled um but again i mean you know moose are huge and if you if he if he'd shot that and again it's it's he's tired it's late at night it's pitch black the dogs are going ballistic his adrenaline is going to be so incredibly high if the dog is in the team he has got to shoot that dog uh, sorry he's got to shoot that moose in such a way that the moose falls out of his team so it's not just the case of pulling his, his gun out and shooting it he's got to get himself in a position where when he drops the moose it falls away from his dogs. Otherwise, it's gonna he's gonna end up with, you know, a moose could take out four of his dogs easily if it fell on top of them. Right. So no, I mean the the only possible thing he can have done is not entirely gutted it. You know, maybe I don't know, um maybe he just took out the the stomach. Maybe he didn't take out the lungs or he didn't take out the esophagus. Or the liver, or the heart—I I don't know. And, and again, as we discussed before, he said that he hadn't done a pretty job. But again, the rules state you gut the moose, and that's what he's done. This is, uh, yeah, this isn't—I don't think this is finished. Yeah. So you yeah. may be talking about it next week as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, I was waiting for a different storyline to to come up, and this one just seems to be continuing to to develop in different aspects in different ways. So um, we'll continue to monitor the moose situation and see what, what happens next. Um, it's just one, I mean, just one final thing. People who comment on this really need to try and put themselves in, in what was going on with him and what his, what, you know, how rapidly his adrenaline would have been pumping and how, you know, his concern was to get that moose away from his dogs so that no, you know more dogs were injured. And again, he, I want to re-emphasize the fact that he would, if if he thought that dog was critical or was badly injured, he'd have gone back to Squintner one hundred percent. He would not have carried on. All right, so I've got a follow up question for you before we move on. I think this is my last question on this topic, and um, this comes from Layperson Folo Q. Uh, what makes gutting a large animal so important that not properly doing so incurs a race penalty? Is that just mostly related to the state law? Um, it's, I guess it's probably the law of the North. I don't, uh, and it's, you know, it's common sense and it's good. You know, if you don't gut the, if you don't gut it properly, then you're going to damage the meat. Uh, I did. again I, I read a post this morning that all all alaskans survive on on moose meat and i don't think that's you know i don't think that's quite true i know i know one or two alaskans who who don't survive on moose meat but it, it's it's you know it's it's all about not wasting a harvest um and you know if you if you if you don't get the guts out then you know the, the meat is gonna is gonna go is gonna go bad so that's the that's the reason is you you clean all of, you clean everything out 
um, so that the, the the rest of the meat is is fully salvageable. Um, and you know that that meat is going to be you know it's going to be recovered and it's going to go to the villages. Um, and so people are going to you know people are going to benefit from this. You know people who are on a subsistence. You know I, I, this, that was maybe flippant saying you know all all Alaskans don't eat um, don't eat meat don't eat moose meat. People there are people in the villages who are reliant on a subsistence lifestyle. And so, yeah, people in the villages, that meat is very important to them. Um, and so that's why it's so important that it's, you know, that the, 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 the moose is gutted and the meat is recoverable and it can be, you know, it can be eaten. Yeah. Got you. Got you. All right. So I say we move on to, uh, let's just talk a little bit about the front of the pack a little bit. Um, you and I were kind of talking about that before we went live. I mentioned, um, you know, I woke up this morning to a text from my brother. He had just moved to the, the Takatna checkpoint and he just in his eyes, he said that that seeing um, Travis's team leave, they look really strong and he felt good about their chances. And so I'm curious what you're seeing and what, what your thoughts are at the front of the pack. Yeah, I, again, as, uh, you know, we, we've discussed this in, uh, in in messages that I, I tend to, you know, because of I guess because of where I've always raced, I tend to look more at the back of the pack. But it, you know, you obviously keep a, a keep a, a a weather eye on 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 the front. Um, I've thought for the last couple of days that this is this is Dallas's race to to lose, and I think that um, the fact that he has taken his twenty four in cripple is a sign that he is you know he's up, you know he's leading you know he's leading the race. I I did have a quick look. When you, when you said what you know that Sean thought that this was Travis's race to lose, I had a quick look at the uh, the timings out of um, out of Ofa, and um, I think Travis is about uh, twenty hours twenty hours behind um, Dallas, which would put him around about four hours four hours in front, maybe. Um, which isn't, you know, isn't a great deal at this stage. Um, if, you know, if, if there's a two hour penalty for Dallas and the, the time differential isn't much, I think one, I think Dallas was bib seven and, and yep. um, Travis was 17. So there's not a huge amount of in the time differential either. So that, again, this two hour penalty could really come back and be a big, a big player at the end of the race. But I just think, um, you know, Travis took his 24 in Tocotna. It's super busy. Uh, you know, I've 20, I 24 myself there in Tocotna, so I know how busy, how noisy it is, how many people there are around. The dogs don't get the best rest. Um, Dallas has taken his 24 in 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 Cripple. It's, um, you know, it's a super quiet. You know, it's, it's, there's only the race there. It, it's only sets up for the race. So there's nobody there but, but vets and officials. So he's got everybody and volunteers. So he's got everybody is focused on his team. The next team, I think I think Nick was 15 or 16 hours arriving thereafter. So mm -hmm. Dallas's dogs have had 15 hours of no, nobody else around whatsoever. They have got, you know, that critical time, that first 15 hours, they have had the whole checkpoint to themselves, nothing to disturb them, nothing to keep them awake, no teams coming coming or going. You know, um, Travis's team, I mean, he, he may have got a good parking spot away from the um, away from the community centre, but there's going to be teams coming in and out constantly. Um, I, yeah, I, I was surprised when you said that Sean thought this was Travis's race to, to lose. I, I think it's Dallas's race to lose at the moment. But again, it's... I mean, you, you know, you, you know this. You, until everybody has had their twenty-four, you've got really got no idea where the race is. Um, you know, when when Travis gets to Cripple, it's not it's not a fun run. Uh, from I don't think it's a particularly fun run from Ofa to to Cripple. I've I've only done it once, but it seems to it seems to drag on forever. The, you know, you you think you're getting close to Cripple, and it just goes on and on and on. It seems to take forever to get there, and when um, you know when um, Travis gets there, he's going to have to rest. You know, it's a seven. I think it's a seventy-mile run. Even if he camps, he's going to have to rest. So, you know, he's going to probably have to take a three or four-hour rest. So now, you know, that twenty hours, you're now they're they're, they're super close. Um, and Dallas is going to be leaving Cripple for the run to Ruby with a dog team that has just had twenty-four hours rest, fifteen or sixteen hours, which are absolute solid rest where he's not been disturbed at all. So he's going to be leaving, you know, he's going to be leaving a mile to a mile and a half 
an hour faster than than Travis is running when he leaves Cripple. So, um, yeah, I think I think it was really smart of Dallas to take his twenty four in in Cripple, and I think it's a it's a winning strategy to do that. So it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to see, you know, the time that it takes uh, Travis to get to Cripple, how long he actually rests in Cripple. Um, and then you know how fast the two teams are when they when they both leave to run to run to Ruby. But it's still so early in the race; it's hard to know. But I, you know, I, I thought for the last couple of days that Dallas has got this, but there's nobody getting close to him. So I was kind of surprised when you said that you thought that Sean Sean thinks that Travis has got it. I I still think it's Dallas's race. But again, it's so close that that two hours could be you know that two hours could be super critical. And and if that's the case. This is going to be getting discussed about long after the finish line. Yeah, um, <clears throat> you know, it's nice that Sean and I have differing opinions, right? So I'm still, I still think it's Dallas's to lose personally. Um, but you know, getting that text from Sean this morning saying that he thought they looked good and that he felt that, you know, it, it was. I'm like, okay, all right, I like the difference of opinions here, and. Um, you know, so just just interesting to, to talk about the, the difference of, you know, styles that are going on at the top. And, um, you know, I'll be interested to see. I'm sure Ryan has a big push in him at some point. He's going to make a statement move or two. So uh, there'll yeah. be a lot, lot, lot more to come. There's still literally 550 miles left for Dallas. He still has over half of the race left. So. There's a lot of time for a lot more developments, and um, yeah, I'm excited to see but what Dallas, happens. Dallas, and, I, and I, I mean, I haven't, I haven't looked into, I haven't looked into this, but Dallas isn't. Um, when, if I think back, he's not the guy who's going to do the big pushes at the start of the race. He is the guy who's finishing fast, and so people need, you know, that also needs to be borne in mind that you know his strength is in the second half of the race. So he has, you know, he's coming into the time when he's going to he's going to start moving faster than everybody else as well. Uh, but I, 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 again, I don't know what his race, his run rest strategy is. I'm just guessing. Yeah. I mean, just based on a little studying I've done, you know, you don't usually see him do over a seven hour run. Um, and, you know, he's, he's more on the shorter runs and the shorter rest, but like there's still seems to be a ratio. It's usually like two or three hours less than what the run was is what his rest is kind of thing. So, um, but moving on from, from that, I am very curious to hear you kind of break down a little bit. You know, we have all these teams that have just finished their 24 hours or are coming off of their 24 hours. Can you talk about the mindset? Can you talk about the strategy? Can you talk like, do you, do you just have that 24 hour run? Do you just go into a big run and hit like an eight hour run? Are you like, is it more about figuring out how you get to your next eight hour? Like what's the mindset now? Uh, yeah, I guess it's going to, a lot's going to depend on, you know, what you, you know, what you're seeing in front of you, how, how your dogs were coming in, um, you know, into the 24, um, how much rest you got, you got yourself, you know, where you, where you took the 24 can, can be a factor. And as I said, how much, how many other teams there there are around you? You you know you're going to have um, you're going to have a, a race plan before the race, so you're going to know. Uh, you know you're going to have a rough idea um, how you're going to want to run. I would you know somebody leaving to Kotna, I, I think is really unlikely that they're going to be planning to run to Ofa and and break again there. They're probably going to try and do uh, two runs to two runs to Cripple from from to Kotna. Um, you are a, a big, you know, a, a big difference between the quest and the, and the Iditarod is you take your, you know, on the quest, you would take your 36 hours halfway through the race on, um, on the Iditarod on the Northern route, you are probably, and I, and I saw that nobody did that this year. You're going to take your breaks in Nikolai, McGrath, Tocotna or Ofer. And the only people who are going to 24 in Cripple people who think they are you know people are pushing for the front of the race or pushing to win um as like i said there was i was surprised how few people took their took their breaks in in mcgrath uh nobody nobody nikolai only a few in mcgrath and mcgrath 
is a really good um, or is a really good place to break. But you've got, you know, you have to again if you if you're taking if you've taken your twenty four in McGrath, you're only eighteen miles to to Cotner, so you're not planning on, you know, you're not planning on taking a break into Cotner. You're gonna you're gonna run to Ofa, um, and then from Ofa you're pretty gonna try and do one run to one run to Cripple. Um, so yeah, it really depends on what your your pre race strategy is. Um, the dogs, the dogs have had, you know, hopefully the dogs have had a good twenty four hours rest. You you know any kinks in the dogs that um, that you had coming in, you've you know you've worked those out. You know you you would massage and looking after the dogs. Maybe if the, you know you may have dropped a dog, um, you're going to have got some sleep. Not you know I think. Um, I'm just trying to think back. I tried to to feed at least every six hours, um, so you're trying to get maybe three hours sleep between feedings. So you you know over that 24 hour period, you, you're probably going to get the best. Well, you are going to get the best sleep on your race. So you're going to be coming out more mentally clear than you were coming in onto your 24. Um, you know you've had chance to talk to people. So yeah, hopefully you're coming out off your twenty four in a good frame of mind. You've got a clear strategy, or you you're running to the to the plan you had before, um, and so you you know you're not going to deviate from that. Um, again, yeah, the ones who took their twenty, the ones who are twenty four in in Ofa, they're probably going to plan to do a single run through to to Cripple. So uh, yeah, not not a not a huge amount should change. Hopefully the mush is in a better frame of mind. The dogs are you know the dogs are pumped up. Because they've, you know, they've had twenty four hours of doing nothing but, you know, eating, sleeping, and getting a walk around. Um, yeah. So I guess my que my question to follow up to that is about, um, you know, if you just have that twenty four hours, like the tank is full in the dogs right so can you come out of that checkpoint and get a long run in or do you almost like need to have like a a, a warm-up run a shorter run and then maybe you can like make a statement move or something like that um I, again it would it would depend on your on your pre-race plan you know what your ambitions are for the race um i wouldn't you know I mean, personally, I wouldn't be doing. I wouldn't be doing a long run. You want to, you know, you want to warm the dogs back into it. They just had twenty four hours. They just, they just had twenty four hours off. Um, I wouldn't see, like, if you were again, it's going to depend on, on your location. If you're in, uh, you know, you twenty four into Cotner, you've you've got nearly ninety miles to um, to cripple. It would be. <laughs> It would be race suicide, I think, to to go and do a single run from uh, from Tecotna to Cripple off your twenty. You you would just destroy everything that you've just done. You know, every you you, you just to recover. You know, you you would just get rid of all that benefit you've got from your twenty four hours. So, no, I mean, for me, I would probably be looking to if, if I twenty four in Tecotna, I'd be looking to get halfway to Cripple. And there is a there is a cabin, um, just under halfway, um, where you where you could potentially camp, but. No, I, I wouldn't be doing any any long runs. You wanna you wanna make sure that you are you are not gonna destroy all the all the good work you've just done by recovering that dog team on your twenty four. It wouldn't make sense to go and, in my opinion, to go and do a dog a long run. But then I'm not I'm not in the mindset where I'm looking to to you know to to win the race. Sure, um, sure. It'll be interesting. But I mean, it's quite a long run. For, it's quite a long run from um, Cripple to Ruby. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what you know what Dallas does if he does if he does a single run from Cripple to Ruby. He's got the advantage that he can get to Ruby, and he can take his eight hour. You know, he, and so if he wanted to do that long run, he, he could then take his eight hour mandatory in Ruby, and recover the dogs that way. Um, yeah, it'll actually be yeah, it will be interesting to see what he does from from Cripple. But again, he could he could break it up and then skip Ruby totally, and uh, you know maybe go on to to Galena. Yeah, it's 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 always fun to speculate like what what the next uh, moves are on these different racers. You know, is he gonna straight shot it to the next point? Is he gonna break it into different runs? Um, but one thing that I wanted to, you know, we talked a little bit beforehand, and you mentioned that you kind of enjoy seeing looking at how the back of the pack is doing. 
So I want to kind of pick your mind on that a little bit. And uh, I'm just curious, is there is there anything that just stands out to you in general about what you're seeing from the back of the pack? Um, I think everybody is running pretty, pretty steady. I mean, I'm, I'm looking, you know, I know um, I, I don't know so many at the back of the pack. It's been a few years since I raced. I obviously know Connor. Uh, I know Connor well, so I'm, you know, I'm looking to see how, how he's doing um everybody is pretty close together there's nobody getting at the moment there's nobody getting uh cut off um everybody is running big teams still there's nobody dropped a, a lot of dogs and when you know when you saw those pre-race videos of um um sorry some somebody just said they sent me a message saying they thought we we're supposed to be on youtube so i don't know if this is going out or not so um yeah so um, when you saw the pre-race videos of the state of the, you know, the state of the burn, um, everybody was obviously, I mean, everybody was expecting that. So they must, so they must've been super cautious going through there because, you know, nobody has dropped even the front or the back of the pack. Nobody has dropped a lot of dogs. Um, so, but, uh, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm just looking to see, you know, you look at run times, how long people are spending in checkpoints where, you know, where they're going to take their take their 24 um and like i said everybody seems pretty close together there's nobody getting cut off there's nobody running particularly slowly um you get, again I, I think i said before i was surprised that connor took eight hours in finger lake but um because you know it's super early in the race but maybe there are you know maybe there are reasons for for that um yeah yeah i was uh <clears throat> i was talking with uh some other folks and um my my the collective conversation we were kind of saying that it felt like right now some of the back of the pack is kind of playing it safe they're kind of more sticking to their maybe not crazy long runs airing on the side of getting a couple more hours of rest um i was listening to isaac tford um he was talking about how the dog team looks great they're they're all two-year-old pups and uh he's kind of just like you know a little over a third of the way in and so he's like i'm really eager to see what i can start to do now that the first third of the race is over so um you know i know that i ex i'm excited to see what moves are going to happen from the back of the pack i expect to see like an amanda Otto maybe make a push or uh jo josie tear or someone like that um you know any thoughts on that yeah i think yeah you're right i mean amanda should have um a pretty a pretty good dog team um but again i mean there's there's it's totally totally different mentalities from the front the back and you know and and the middle as well um the uh yeah your objective at the back of the pack is to you know is to get to know is to get to know them as quickly as possible but it's to get to know um and it's not to get, you know, it's not to get cut off. I'm not saying that this is everybody, you know, I'm not saying everybody at the back of the pack has this mentality, but there's always that possibility that if you get cut off from the rest of the back of the pack, you could get, you could end up getting with, withdrawn from the race. Um, and so, you you know, you need to stick together. But again, there's nobody, apart from that eight hours that Connor took in Finger Lake, there's nobody taking super long rests. There's, you know, I, I saw that somebody took, um, I may have been Jeff Reed took like five hours in, and I'm, I apologize if I got this wrong, but it was like something like five hours in Nikolai and he took a long time in, in McGrath and that, but again, he's, you know, he's still, he's still in there. He's still in there in the group. Um, and so you can, you know, he can be adjusting his rest according to what, you know, what he's seeing in front of him, what, you know, what, what his dogs are doing. Um, yeah, I, there are going to be people, you know, probably like Amanda who's, you know, she's going to have a pretty de I would imagine she's got a pretty detailed, um, you know, race plan, which has been, you know, she's discussed it with, you know, with Jeff and he's going to have given her a lot of advice. Um, but again, I, I guess her, her, her goal is going to be to get to, to know him with as many dogs as possible of the dogs to be, uh, to be, to be looking good. So, um, yeah, I, I think that, there's nobody as far as i can see there's nobody who's you know is in any danger there's nobody who's even close to scratching you know there's everybody has got a lot of dogs left I, you know 
I think sure. last time I looked, the smallest team was, was 13 still, I think. Yeah, I'm doing a quick little over look over, and I think that you're right. And we love to love to see that. Uh, looks looks like maybe Anna has dropped a few dogs. She's down to ten. Um, okay. Oh wow. Okay. But outside of that, everyone is looking strong. So that's yeah. great news. I mean, that's that, yeah, that surprised me because I mean that trail did look. I mean, the, I think it was 2060. We went through the burn. It was pretty. It was pretty awful. But that that trail. You know the the video of the iron dog going that looked dreadful and you know so you really have to slow things down and look after look after the dog so it's good that there was no no injuries getting through that so uh so i i wanted to you know check in with you and see how things are going on your end um i know that sean and i and a lot of other race fans were sad when you know you made your decision to withdraw this year and I just I'm curious to check in and just see how you Rob Cook are doing. I've been suffering from uh, there's been some stuff going on which is you know, had, had an impact on my mental health. I, you know, I was seeing a counselor from uh, last May through until October. Um, and then uh, things got worse from uh, from October onwards. Um, and it's, you know, it's not helped by the, you know, definitely not helped by the lack of, of sunlight in the north. You know, every, every winter, you know, I, you know, you get down in sort of December and January when you know when you are getting the sunlight deficiency but this year was this year was super bad I, the depression was was um was was exceptionally exceptionally um bad over that period of time you know i um and so it was i was finding it i was doing a lot of training um, but i wasn't doing the right sort of training i would you know i i couldn't i couldn't bring myself to go out and camp and camping, you know, for, for mid and long distance racing is, is vitally important. You know, you need to do those, you know, we're talking about, you know, run rest strategies when you come off at 24, you know, you have to have done, you have to have replicated that sort of thing where you, you know, you've gone out and you've run for five hours and you've rested for four hours on the trail. And I hadn't, I hadn't done any of that. Um, and so I wasn't in the right frame of mind to go to Cusco. So that's why I, you know, I hadn't done that before Cusco. And so I withdrew from Cusco and then that was the, you know, that was the race training that I needed for Iditarod. Um, and I actually thought that um, I actually thought that some things were going to change in February and things were going to improve in February and that they didn't. Uh, if anything, you know, some things were getting worse and the depression was, was getting worse. Um, and so, um, you know, it's the, 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 the drop bag, you know, when you have to, you know, submit the drop bags, that's a big, that's a big deal, particularly from here, you know, from, for me to do, to do my drop bags, I have to drive to Anchorage. So that's, um, you know, it's a 28 hour round trip drive to do that. Then there's the, the cost of that. And then it's the cost of, you know, the cost of the drive and then there's a the cost of putting in the drop bags. Um, and so that was a real, a real marker for me. And I, and when I, you know, when I, so that was the point I really had to make the decision if I was going to race. Um, and because things weren't getting better with depression, what I didn't want to do was get out on the trail, be sleep deprived, um, and find that the depression was getting worse and that I ended up having to, you know, I'd end up having to scratch because I just couldn't, um, you know, I, I couldn't face, uh, continuing and it's, um, you know, you've got to be in that right frame of mind to look after, you know, to look after the dogs properly, to give the dogs the, the, the proper care. And I, and I will say, you know, the, the dogs uh, are a real lifesaver, you know, having them around and just um, whether, you know, whether you're running them or not, or just being with them. Um, but when you, you know, when you're massively sleep deprived, when, you know, when it's cold, when you don't want to camp out on the trail, then even having the dogs with you, is not uh, is not necessarily gonna gonna help so you know I, i'm i hope things you know things are going to improve over the next you know over the next few months but yeah i'm you know and hopefully i'll come back i don't i don't think i've said this so many times in the past i don't think i'll ever do another thousand mile race i think 
this was going to be my final thousand mile race, but I've got a bunch of young dogs here. Or we, you know, we've got a bunch of young dogs here. There's races I'd still like to do. So, you know, hopefully next winter or the winter after we'll go back and do some more mid distance racing. So I don't think this is the last that people will see of me racing. All right. That's good to know. And well, first of all, you know, I appreciate you just going and maybe talking about a subject that maybe is uncomfortable for others, you know? Um, so I just appreciate you kind of just adding a little bit of depth to your story and sharing that with folks. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, you made the best decision for yourself and for those damn dogs. And, um, my question to you was after you made that decision, I'm sure there was, it was tough to make, but there had to be a sense of relief off of your shoulders, right? Um, yeah, there was a, there was a, there was a, probably a bigger sense of relief when I withdrew from Cusco. Um, when was there, a, I, I'll say now I, I'm not, I don't regret the decision. Uh, sitting here today, I am, um, it was absolutely the right decision not to do Iditarod for me and and for the, for the dog. Somebody somebody said to me, "Oh, the dogs, you know, the, you know, the, you know, you need to do this for the dogs." That's the you absolutely, I absolutely didn't need to do this for the dogs. The dogs don't care whether they run to know to to know or not. Um, I think this is uh, this is so egotistical. Um, when I when I withdrew, my biggest concern was um, the, my sponsors. You know, we have a, a pretty good sponsorship. And so the fact that I felt like a fraud, that, you know, people had sponsored me and I, to, people had sponsored me to run the Iditarod and I wasn't doing it. I'd taken their money and I wasn't doing that and I'd taken their support. Um, and then um, there's also the fact that we, you know, we have a, a pretty, the kennel has a pretty strong, Facebook following, I think, you know, there's, I don't know, 30, 35,000 followers on, on Facebook. Um, and a lot of them follow because, you know, we're Siberian Huskies and we were the only Siberian Husky in the race, a Siberian Husky team in the race. And so I realize, you know, I feel that I'm, I'm disappointing, uh, a lot of, a lot of fans. Um, there's the person who, uh, who had won won the auction for my Idita rider? I felt you know that came to my mind that um, that I was letting them down because they'd paid a lot of money to be my Idita rider and I and I wasn't turning up. Um, and even you know I put a post on social media, and I wanted to explain to people I wasn't just scratching that there was genuine reasons why I wasn't scratching. But even writing that post and posting that, I couldn't. I couldn't go on social media for the next two days after I put that post on there because I was so scared of of what people were gonna, you know, think about me. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, so it wasn't. It, I, I'm not sure there was a sense of relief because I had to. I then had to deal with the fact that I'd gone out there. You know, I, I had to deal with the fact that I was disappointing fr friends, disappointing family, disappointing sponsors. Um, and and then and then for the next two days i stressed myself out over the fact i'd put something on social media about it um but you know i i have absolutely no regrets it was absolutely 100 percent the right decision for me and for the and for the dogs so yeah well like i said i just appreciate you your openness and willingness to talk about it um I, just uh was getting some feedback in the chat that they really appreciate your honesty and your openness as well um so you know we don't have to ask too many more questions on that but i did want to at least ask you know how the heck you're doing and and uh you know it sounds like there's some more work to be done but it sounds like overall you're doing well and damn it you're here with us today and and i'm just super happy that you were willing to do that so um thank you for that and uh come from a like a, I do come from a military background um where back in you know 20 30 years ago mental health was never was never talked about and you, if you had if you admitted to poor mental health you were considered to be weak or you know, failure um and I've had so many people and I'm so grateful so many people have reached out to me 
mushers, fa friends, family, and they've said they've you know they've said that we're going through this as well. You're not you know you, uh, you're not on your own on this, and it, and it, I think it's a really big thing that people are much more prepared to talk about mental health today than they were 10, 15 years ago. And it's, it's absolutely not a stigma. Somebody is not weak because they are getting depressed because, you know, life isn't life isn't great. Uh, it really isn't. A, it really shouldn't be a stigma. So. Yeah, I I fully support mental health. I have been in counseling uh, on and off for years. And so, you know, Sean and I talk about that. And you talked about the struggle with the sunlight every single December, January, and a little bit of February, I notice with the distance that's created with me being in Atlanta, Georgia, and Sean being Alaska, I'm like, man, there's like this void here. Like, it just feels like Sean's not himself. And, you know, when he was mushing, it would be even, even I feel like worse because he's got less time to focus on himself because he's focused on all those dogs. And so, um, you know, I just, it's, I, we appreciate the insight and, um, and so what I want to do, I want to bring it back to the race. All right. Cause we've been getting a couple questions actually from the chat on this as well. <clears throat> and the first question I want to follow up with you on is related to Nick Petit. So I, I, I haven't had a chance to see the video, but it sounds like he stated at his most recent video on the insider is that his plan is to take a 24 hour in Ruby. And so I'm just wondering, uh, you know, what is your opinion on a move like that? That's interesting. I, you know, I saw that he was into cripple this morning and I, I just anticipated that, uh, that he was going to 24 in, in cripple. Um, that's, I mean, Ruby is a good place. It's, um, the it's really good hospitality you particularly he's going to be there he's going to be there again we get we're back to the, this point about you know how how beneficial it was for for dallas to have 15 hours in cripple all on his own um if nick is running through to ruby he's going to have a good chunk of time in ruby um on his own uh he's gonna have the checkpoint to himself like i said it's a warm you know you, the dogs are really close are really close to the checkpoint um it's a warm place to sleep it can you know when there's a lot of teams in there it can get pretty noisy um, but again he's going to be there on his own there's always good food good hospitality the community is super super friendly and super welcoming um uh nick has been looks like you know he's running pretty conservatively um, like when I was looking at him before, uh, a couple of days ago, he was, uh, kind of towards the front of the middle of the pack or at the back of the front of the pack. He wasn't doing any, any long runs. He wasn't, you know, running his, overrunning his dogs. Um, so if he, if, you know, if he continues that into Ruby, then it's probably, a yeah, you know, there's definitely, a, you know, there's definitely advantages. And again, I think he's, I think he still has 16 dogs. Um, I think he had 16 coming into cripple, I think, or he's certainly 15 or 16. He hasn't dropped many if he's, so it could be a smart, you know, it could be a smart move. He's going to, he's yep. going to end yes. up having to, yep. to take, sorry. Well, I was just confirming he does have 16 as you were saying. Right. Okay. Yeah. He's going to, he's going to end up taking his, um, his eight pretty close to his 24. But again, if he takes his 24 in Ruby, I would think that he would probably take his eight in Coltag, and that means he's going he's going onto the Portage on you know with, on an eight hour break, um, and so that's going to set him up for a good run to you to Unilucle. So I mean he, you know he know, again he he's the one who's seen the dog team that's in front of him, sixteen dogs if they're looking good, and he and he you know he does a good run he has a sensible run into Ruby, then it could be a smart it could be a smart move. I certainly didn't, you know, again, when I was looking at him a couple of days ago and he was, as I said, he was quite a way back. He was down sort of 10th or 11th. I didn't think, I didn't have him down as somebody who was going to be in contention, but yeah, again, he's, this is obviously his pre-race strategy. This isn't something that's, that's come out of the blue. I, th you know, I, I think, I, you know, I think the cripple, you know, 24 in cripple is a ballsy move. That wasn't something you saw a couple of years ago. Um, but the race, you know, I mean, the race is changing. The race is evolving. Um, 
this is it'd be interesting to know if anybody else has done you know gone so far into the race but again uh, you know we i go back to what you know the, go back to the quest where you you take your you take your your, your long mandatory rest 500 miles into the race um on the Iditarod, you traditionally do it a lot shorter, you know, two, three hundred miles in the race. So there's, there's absolutely no reason why the dogs cannot deal with, you know, taking their twenty-four in cripple in, in Ruby. It could be a it could be a smart thing. It'll be interesting to watch. Yeah. Um uh I I'm just Nick Petit particularly, he always I feel like throws the average couch mushing fan like myself for a curveball because the, like I feel like was it last year I think that he took his 24 hour in like Nikolai or something like that so like he took it super early on and now he's going to the complete other end of the spectrum and doing it all the way in Ruby and so I, I do find the move uh, in, in Nick Petit fashion relatively interesting one to analyze I think, I mean, on that, I think taking a 24 in Ruby makes a lot more sense than taking the 24 in Nikolai. Um, it's, you know, again, there was nobody took their 24 there this year. Um, I remember, I think Hugh Neff took his 24 there a few years ago. Um, Matt Failer, um, it must have been 2016 that Matt Failer took his 24 there. And that was only because he'd stabbed, he stabbed himself in the leg with a knife. And so he needed not not to take his twenty not as an excuse to take his twenty four, but you know he wanted the he wanted the recovery time. That you know I think I, I personally think Nikolai is way too early in the race to take uh, to take the twenty four. I think I think McGrath McGrath is probably a bit too early. You know, Tocotner is ideal, um, but Nikolai is way too early. So yeah, it makes more sense to do it in in, in Ruby than um, than in Nikolai. I I. I I, I don't think it's I don't think you can overemphasize just how important it would be to have a quiet checkpoint for the dogs. You know, again, this is, you know, obviously this is one of the benefits for, for Dallas and Cripple. To Cotner, like I remember when I 24 in into Cotner, we were we were parked down by the there were a ton of dog teams there. We were parked down by the community center, right next to the community center. In fact, there were constantly people walking through the dogs walking next to the dogs, the, you know, the insider around the dogs all the time. There were, you know, children coming along, interacting with the dogs. The dogs just didn't get a good rest. Um, and even if you, you know, even if you're into Cotton and you're up on the hill by the church, you've still got dog teams coming in and out constantly. And the dogs aren't going to get as much rest as they're going to get if you have the checkpoint yourself. So, yeah, again, it, I think it's a smart move. For, it was a smart move for Dallas to take 24 and cripple and I think if it works out for Nick, it could be a really good thing for for his dogs that, um, you know, he's gonna he's gonna get a good break in in Ruby before other dog teams start coming through. So his dogs are gonna get a really good rest, and he's gonna get you know he's gonna get good sleep as well. So, yeah, as long as the dogs are good, then it could be a good it could be a good move for him. Yeah. Um, all right. So a couple of other things that were coming into the chat here, Rob. Um, one question was. What are you looking for as the race develops after all the leaders have taken their 24? Is there anything that, you know, kind of got on your mind? Um, I think once everybody is off the 24, that's the, that's the first time you really see the actual, you know, what, what where people, where the, the real positions on the race up to that point, you don't, you don't really have a clue what's, what's going on. You know, the, on the 24, you take it, you know, the time differentials are, um, you know, are, are taken in, into consideration, so that those are those are those go on the twenty four, so that people are actually running in their real positions. So, um, and you're also looking, um, up, you know, at race speeds, as, you know, as, as teams coming off their twenty four. And again, that's another good thing. We, we you know, Dallas is going to be coming off his off his twenty four in cripple with a team that's going to be running faster than Travis would have coming out of cripple because he's just had that 70, 70 mile run. So it's going to take a, you know, a day or so to see what people's relative speeds are. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's the main thing I think is, uh, is how fast dogs are now running. 
um, and the relative positions because you know everybody's now had their 24 and you know start differentials are taken into effect I did actually that was one thing I noticed about um, about Connor you know, I apologize to go back to Connor because he because he was bib number three I can't I can't remember whether the race differentials are three minutes but if that's the case his two. his real two is it okay but he, even then his his um I can't remember who was whether it was Jeff had a had a had a low bib number, but even that 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 was with with time differentials between Connor and whoever is at the back, whoever was a late starter, their differential is an hour. So Connor was actually effectively, I think, coming into Nikolai was in last position, even though you know in race positions, you know in in you know sorry sequence coming into Nikolai, he wasn't he was effectively in last position. So time differentials didn't you know will make a difference. So that's that's the main thing is. He, you know, once everybody's twenty four, then they're actually on their, they're actually on their, you know, their genuine race position, and it's going to then a, a case of seeing how fast people, how fast teams are going to be coming off their twenty four. Yeah, I think that's one thing that I'll be interested to monitor is the speed of which these people are coming off of their twenty fours, and you know, um, you know, like I was watching. Dallas as he was getting into cripple and he was maintaining right there 7.5 to 8.5 miles an hour like I mean I wasn't watching it every minute but every time I checked 7.9 8.1 7.8 um so I'll be interested to see Actually, this goes yeah this goes back to how as we were talking before how he's always run run the race he he runs conservatively at the start of the race so again this this makes me think that this is his race to lose not not Travis's to to win. Uh, yeah, he's gonna. Yeah. Um. All right. So we had some follow up here in the chat. Uh, Nick in his interview said that he's had this plan to stop in, uh, in Crip or in Ruby for a few years, but this was the first time he's actually been able to set it up and do it. He admitted that Nikolai last year was a mistake. Um. So I guess he's providing a little bit of insight on what we're kind of theorizing on. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then let's see, is there anything else in here? Uh, just wanted to follow up a couple more comments trickled in, in, re in regards to our conversation earlier about how you were doing. And one was just like, depression is very real issue and maybe one that other mushers can relate to. Let me just mute this. Uh, Rob's transparency and vulnerability is inspiring um, from faith. Hope you're doing better, Rob. We appreciate how open and honest you've been. Um, and so just, I, you know, I feel like it's worth sharing those with you to just l let you know that the fans do appreciate you being here, providing some analysis and also talking about a little bit of what you've been going through. So, um, with that, uh, there, there are other mushers. Other mushers reached out to me, so yeah, other mushers are definitely, you know, definitely, have, you know, experience this. Yeah, right. Um, so before we wrap things up, I know we're. I want to be respectful of your time, uh, and I know that we're kind of getting close to where we need to have you uh, for your hard out time. So, is there anything else on your mind that you've seen in the race, or just that you want to mention before we? Uh, before we bid you adieu no i think it's uh it's, it's interesting that there's nobody as far as i can see that you know there's nobody even close to scratching at the moment that i mean you, you know you mentioned that there's one team of, of down to 10 dogs but again there seems to be a lot of um you know a lot of big teams still running you know some of the you know people are sharing some of the videos and, and sean's gonna have a much better idea of this because you know he's there on the ground so he's gonna be um you know he's gonna be seeing it, it looks like there's a lot of really nice looking dog teams i think um you know my i think the tough part of the race is going to come i mean i i uh i, I from, from from my perspective anyway you know the the tough part of the race is from unilocally the frightening part of the race is probably from unilocally to um to the finish to the finish line and then you know I wouldn't even say white mountain i mean we had this conversation when we did the podcast with, with you and sean before you know what sean went through um out of out of safety you know i you know i i i you know for me from for my mind the the, the worst part of iditarod is you know you know the more, the more challenging part of iditarod is from unilocally to the finish line so we've got the we've got the exciting part to come in this 
Uh, I'm going to be, I'm actually going to start looking at the front of the pack now to, you know, I'm interested, <laughs> you know, to see whether, you, you know, whether, whether Sean's right and this is Travis's race to lose or, you know, whether, you know, whether Dallas has done, yeah, Dallas has done the right thing. And yeah, I mean, you know, just the fact you talk about his, his speeds and, and how consistent his speeds are make me even more convinced that he's got this race. But again, <laughs> I, I just if it goes back to two hours, if he loses this race by less than two hours, then I I think that the the social media outrage that has been going on this this week or this last few days is going to get significantly worse. Um, and I hope ITC have got their tin helmets on, um, but maybe it won't come down to that. Maybe Dallas or 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 win by more than two hours or lose by more than two hours, one or the other. So I've got I've got my wrap. I've got my wrap up question for you. Uh, one thing that we haven't talked about that I just kind of popped up into my mind is the fact that Travis has mentioned that he is not 100% healthy right now. He's battling a little bit of a cold. He's not a hundred percent. Can you just speak a little bit upon have, have you been sick during the Iditarod or during a race? How do you power through that? Um, especially sleep deprived, like, now you got to change your attention to maybe starting to care a little bit more about yourself than the dogs. Can you just kind of provide a little bit of insight on that, please? I'm just having a look to see how much long we've got left. In <laughs> uh, in 2018, I got um, food. Po- I think it was food poisoning. Um, around it was around Finger Lake, Rainy Pass, that sort of area, and I I. Yeah, I came. I I camped at the Buffalo camp, um, and there's a there's a, a bit of an incline as you come out of the of the Buffalo camp. And I I, I could I was feel, I wasn't feeling great as I came off the camp, and I climbed up that hill and I projectile vomited and I vomited so much and I was I remember thinking at the time, my God, I feel sorry for the dogs, the teams that are coming behind me because they're going to have to deal with getting, and it just went on. I just I went I went I passed another musher. And I started vomiting again. Um, I by the time I was, you know, this it's, it's obviously it's a long run from um, from Rome to Nikolai. Um, I started to get dehydrated. So you, you know, you're you're carrying when you come off your camp, you, you've got limited amount of supplies left in your in your sled. I was getting super super dehydrated. Um, a, a bunch of snow machinists came up behind me, um, and they you know they they didn't want to get too close to me, but they did give me their water they gave me some water um so i was i was able to, to rehydrate a bit and it turned out that just 18 18 hours later they were they were holed up as well because they uh they got it by the time i got to nikolai i could barely stand up um i was like um i was i could i could hardly you know i could have i literally could hardly stand up at all um jason savidas was I, I wanted to scratch straight away and jason savidas was the was the volunteer or the judge there and he persuaded me to you know to stay a bit longer and uh, and to recover and i was really struggling to to look after the look after the dogs and feed the dogs um and i took a longer break um i took a longer break than i planned to in nikolai um <laughs> and I, again this is this is pretty lucky i i had the vomiting all the way up to Nikolai, and it was once I got into Nikolai that the diarrhea started, and I was pretty pleased. I was actually in the in the checkpoint by the time that um, by the time that coming on. So I started to recover by the time I left Nikolai. I started to feel a bit better, but I just wasn't in the I wasn't in a good place, um, and I'd lost a lot of time, and I wasn't thinking I wasn't thinking straight. So it definitely impacts you. I did I did see this morning that, and again, I was kind of surprised that Miller was was a long way back in the in the oh in i'm the glad race. you mentioned and i see that she's got she's got pancreatitis by the look of it so yep um yep you know it'll be surprising if she's if she's able to carry to carry on i mean, i think she from what i saw she'd gone to i can't remember whether it was in mcgrath or or to cotton they'd actually taken her to a clinic so i'll be interested to see if she's able to to carry on but it's it's horrible it, it, getting sick on the trail is is absolutely awful but you know particularly if you're not in a checkpoint and again you know you want to be it's it's hard enough it's hard enough doing a thousand mile race if you're in good physical condition 
you know any illness at all is going to bring you down and make it so much so much harder so yeah I, if he's not if he's not well that's not um, that's not good yep all right well rob uh, i really appreciate the time today you've been excellent in providing some analysis and some firsthand experience of what you've uh seen there out there on the trail so Thank you for joining uh, joining me today. I say us. It's like an, a natural habit because, like, Sean is with me in spirit while I'm carrying this out. Um, but thank you so much for joining us today, Rob. I'd say hi to Sean as well when you you know when you text him text him next. Uh, as we as we discussed before, I think he's a, he's a good person to have working for Insider, and he's you know he knows what he's looking for when he's you know videoing teams coming in and out of, of checkpoints and thanks for you know thanks for doing this as well definitely definitely i'll definitely mention that to sean and uh just real quick before we sign off i just want to uh remind you all if you haven't subscribed please take a second and subscribe we are so close to hitting a goal of ours uh if you are not subscribing it would mean a lot to us if you did and then tomorrow we will have wade mars on there's uh for tomorrow there's also been a time adjustment we're going to move it back a little bit it's going to be at 5 p.m eastern one o'clock alaska and we're super excited to have wade on uh so on that note thank you all for watching and make sure you tune in tomorrow see you then